Hi, everybody. We're excited to let you know that we've added a great show to the CyberWire Podcast Network. Check out Relativity's Security Sandbox, hosted by Amanda Fennell. Security Sandbox is a series of creatively driven conversations about what it takes to solve complex data problems securely. Hear new ideas and approaches tied to increasing an organization's cybersecurity posture with a little fun in the process. A big welcome to Relativity. This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by ExtraHop. It's becoming clear that today's attacks can't be prevented, but they can be stopped. Modern cyber attackers have already made it inside your network, but you have the upper hand. Find and eradicate threats with ExtraHop network detection and response and shut them out before real damage is done. Learn the advanced techniques attackers are using and how ExtraHop stops them with a live attack simulation. Visit extrahop.com slash cyberwire. That's extrahop.com slash cyberwire. The U.S. and U.K. warn of the possibility of false flag provocations as Russia keeps the pressure on Ukraine. NATO members and others issue warnings of the threat of Russian cyber operations spilling over the Ukrainian border. Two U.S. senators want an accounting from the CIA over an alleged bulk collection operation. No charges filed in the case of a reporter who viewed a website source. The 49ers were hacked. Daniel Prince from Lancaster University on improving security and agile health IoT development. Rick Howard targets supply chain issues with the hash table. And have a careful Valentine's Day. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Monday, December 14th, 2022. Presidents Biden and Putin spoke Saturday in negotiations aimed at reducing tensions over Ukraine, but without result, the Washington Post wrote, and U.S. sources subsequently said the risk of a Russian invasion remained high. The Wall Street Journal reports that Russian influence operations, ranging from disinformation to bomb threats, have continued unabated, and that many Ukrainians feel themselves already fully on the receiving end of a hybrid war. The Ukrainian armed forces have also warned that Russia deployments amount to encirclement, the Telegraph reports, An analysis in The New Atlanticist looks at Russian exercises in Belarus and assesses that an invasion of Ukraine would concentrate on air superiority, close air support, long-range fires, intelligence collection, and combat sustainment. Citing concerns about security, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, has told its members that a number of countries were withdrawing their staff from the OSCE ceasefire monitoring mission in Ukraine. The OSCE has for some time been a burr under the Kremlin's saddle, and the Russian foreign ministry was quick to denounce the announcement as a ploy intended to inflame tension in the region. The Washington Post quoted Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharov that various states were seeking to manipulate the monitoring mission through filthy political games. Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and the Netherlands have all asked their citizens to leave Ukraine, apparently as a reaction to the U.S. warning that a Russian invasion might come as early as this week. Some international airlines have suspended flights to Ukraine, and Kiev has, according to The Guardian, allocated $592 million to pay for measures to secure Ukrainian airspace in the hope of encouraging the resumption of flights. The U.S. grew newly concerned about a Russian false flag provocation designed to provide Moscow with a casus belli against Ukraine, bogus but minimally plausible. The Washington Post says that the U.S. intelligence community's warning of that possibility prompted the U.S. to withdraw diplomatic personnel and urge Americans to leave Ukraine. The provocation is believed to be different from the one the U.S. warned against last week. Those earlier reports suggested that Russia was preparing a staged atrocity film 
showing fictitious Ukrainian outrages against ethnic Russians in the eastern part of the country. The GRU was identified as the operator of a website, DonbassTragedy.info, that represented itself as a portal run by human rights advocates working in eastern Ukraine. The portal retailed atrocity stories in a disinformation campaign directed against Ukraine. Both the British and U.S. governments hope that disclosure of intelligence with an unusual degree of public transparency will serve to dissuade Russia from renewing an invasion of Ukraine. The warnings have been explicit. The U.S. CIA is said to have assessed that Russian forces are prepared to move into Ukraine this Wednesday. A White House official said on Background Saturday, quote, Russia is finding itself on defense in the information space, given our own transparency about its intention, end quote. Shields up, or so the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency put in an advisory published Friday evening. Despite the Trekkie-themed framing of the alert, it's a serious advisory. CISA cites a Russian threat and says the warning represents a shift toward a proactive defensive policy. The agency explains the warning's motivation as follows, quote, Notably, the Russian government has used cyber as a key component of their force projection over the last decade, including previously in Ukraine in the 2015 timeframe. The Russian government understands that disabling or destroying critical infrastructure, including power and communications, can augment pressure on a country's government, military, and population and accelerate their acceding to Russian objectives. While there are not currently any specific credible threats to the U.S. homeland, we are mindful of the potential for the Russian government to consider escalating its destabilizing actions in ways that may impact others outside of Ukraine. Based on this situation, CISA has been working closely with our critical infrastructure partners over the past several months to ensure awareness of potential threats, part of a paradigm shift from being reactive to being proactive. End quote. The advisory goes on to offer familiar advice that any organization might apply to reduce the likelihood of a damaging cyber intrusion, taking steps to quickly detect a potential intrusion, ensuring that the organization is prepared to respond if an intrusion occurs, and to maximize the organization's resilience to a destructive cyber incident. CISA closes by urging organizations to study the detailed prescriptions specific to Russian cyber operations that the agency issued last month. Estonian authorities say their country has been on the receiving end of Russian cyber attacks, but only at roughly the normal rate. The crisis over Ukraine seems not to have produced an increase in the Russian cyber op tempo against Estonia. The Wall Street Journal and others report that U.S. Senators Ron Wyden, Democrat of Oregon, and Martin Heinrich, Democrat of New Mexico, both members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, have asked the CIA to declassify and release information on a bulk collection program that may have extended to some domestic surveillance. It's not clear from the senator's heavily redacted letter what the scope of the surveillance would have been, including whether U.S. citizens were directly targeted or were the inadvertent bycatch of collection against foreign targets. The news, Fortune observes, is likely to have an unwelcome effect on U.S. tech companies operating in Europe, as it's likely to arouse suspicion of GDPR violations. A St. Louis Post-Dispatch reporter who found personal information exposed on a website operated by the Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education will not, after all, be prosecuted for a computer crime. The Cole County prosecutor, to whom the case was referred at the insistence of Missouri Governor Parsons, has declined to file charges. To review, the reporter's offense in the eyes of Governor Parsons was to have viewed the page source on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education site, where he saw personal information about teachers coded into the HTML. He disclosed responsibly what he'd found to the department, which initially intended to thank him. Until, that is, the governor heard of it, decided that the journalist must have hacked the site, because the reporter looked at the code. The governor apparently took this to mean that the reporter had illicitly broken the site's encryption, as opposed to, say, hitting Control u while he looked at the page. The governor directed that the case be referred to the Cole County prosecutor. The FBI advised the state that, as far as it could tell, no one had broken any laws, 
and the prosecutor's minimalist statements about the whole affair suggests a more realistic understanding of the Internet than apparently prevails in the governor's office. Still, some think that loosely worded Missouri computer crime statutes may bear part of the blame. CISA Director Easterly tweeted approval of the Cole County prosecutor's decision. She says it makes responsible disclosure easier. You don't have to make the Super Bowl to be a target for cyber criminals, and playing in Silicon Valley doesn't confer any immunity either. Bleeping Computer reports that the San Francisco 49ers were affected by a ransomware attack on Saturday. It's unclear how successful the attack was, but the 49ers are working on remediation. The BlackBite ransomware crew has claimed responsibility. It's Valentine's Day! Did you notice? The scammers have. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission says that romance scams in general hit record highs in 2021. We would add that you can expect them to continue. Unlike some of you, you know who you are. The scammers haven't waited until the last minute to make their annual observance toward matters of the heart. They're up and at them, not waiting until the 11th hour to buy flowers, candy, stuffed animals, or whatever the criminal equivalents of those things are. So be appropriately on your guard for e-commerce fraud, advanced fee scams, and artful catfishing. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud. SpyCloud constantly recovers and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, a realm packed with credentials, personal information, passwords, and customer information exposed in third-party data breaches, combo lists, and malware infections. With SpyCloud, you now have access to this data that historically has not been available and can take preventative efforts to defend your business against costly cyber attacks and hard-to-detect fraud that can negatively impact your bottom line and brand reputation. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire to learn how to make recaptured data your best defense. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. And it is always my pleasure to welcome back to the show the CyberWire's own chief security officer and chief analyst, Rick Howard. Rick, welcome back. Hey, Dave. So, uh, not surprising to anyone in our audience, first of all, you and I are both men, and... <laughs> well, I'm glad you noticed that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, and more importantly than that, neither one of us are what could be accurately described as young men, and oh, that's so... that's very true, yeah. With both of those categories linked together, that means that I think it's fair to say that both of us uh, are hesitant to admit when we were wrong. And oh, yes. It's, <laughs> it's really hard for me to do. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but in this case, in this case, last time you and I spoke, uh, you actually uh, spoke in error and you wanted to set it right today. So what exactly uh, did you screw up on last week's show? Uh, yes, indeed. Well, uh, we were talking about supply chain attacks, if you remember. And yeah. I made the point that even though we've had some high-profile attacks recently, like SolarWinds, Acelian, and Log4j, that these kinds of attack vectors have been around for years. And I mentioned that the bad guys who attacked Home Depot in 2014 used this third-party digital supply chain technique. And that's where I screwed up. Okay, right oh, there. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't Home Depot in 2014. It was Target in 2013. And my only excuse is that I can't remember my children's names most days of the week. So, you know, cut me some slack. And as one of my favorite comics, Craig Ferguson, on his late night talk show used to say, I look forward to your letters. <laughs> <Go>. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, Rick, lucky for us uh, cybersecurity professionals, particularly the ones who, again, are in that category like you and I, uh, older <laughs> men, are not at all pedantic. They don't like it. No. <laughs> they're not, no, they're not, not sticklers. No, not at all. Not sticklers for any of those details. So I, no, I think you're probably, not. probably in the clear. Yeah. Yeah. They're not important. Why should we worry about little <laughs> details like that? Okay, so. That's right. All right. Well, getting to this week's CSO Perspectives show, uh, I understand you have a new expert that you've invited to the CyberWire hash table. Who's the new guest? 
Well, you know her, Dave. In fact, you talked to her last week on the Daily Podcast. It's Amanda Fennell, the CIO and CSO of a company called Relativity, and she hosts the Security Sandbox Podcast, the latest addition to the CyberWire's collection of security podcasts. And when I heard she was joining our family, I immediately contacted her to be on our bench of security experts that help us understand this kind of changing landscape. And she didn't hesitate. By the way, she's awesome, right? She's yeah. very smart yeah. and highly articulate and about how to explain all this stuff. And so for this show, I asked her to walk us through how her company, Relativity, handled the Log4J crisis over the holiday break this past year. All right. Well, look forward to that. That is part of CSO Perspectives on CyberWire Pro. You can find that on our website. Rick Howard, thanks for joining us. And now a word from our sponsor, Bar Advisory. From startups to enterprises, today's organizations recognize the need for a solid cybersecurity and compliance program. But between the overwhelming number of cybersecurity tools to choose from, various compliance frameworks, and competing priorities, building and maintaining an effective cybersecurity program can be daunting. Bar Advisory's virtual Chief Information Security Officers bring the experience and perspective every organization needs to scale their business while protecting consumer data. Whether you're looking for the right tools to help your well-oiled security team, need assistance responding to due diligence security questionnaires, or you're building a security program from scratch, BAR's virtual CISOs ensure all of your security needs are met at every stage of your business growth, so you can focus on what you do best. Learn more at baradvisory.com slash CISO. And we thank Bar Advisory for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Daniel Prince. He is a senior lecturer in security and protection science at Lancaster University. Uh, Daniel, it is always great to welcome you back to the show. You and I have spoken previously about uh, health IoT security issues. Uh, and I know something that uh, is uh, on your mind is making sure that the folks who are developing these things understand the folks that they're up against, some of those threat actors. What, what exactly are you working on here? Yeah, so our research project here at Lancaster, which is uh, funded under the uh, National IoT uh, Centre for Security and Privacy, Petrus, in the UK, we're we're looking at this idea of how do we help developers understand the threat actors and the ways that they operate so that they can really try to start to enhance the security of their products using agile uh, development methodologies. So we're specifically focusing on agile development approaches for health IoT. And so can you give us some examples of how that plays out? So one of the the key things that we're looking at here is uh, allowing the companies that are doing the development to understand these actors and really getting a good sense of how they might attack their products and what they might want to seek to achieve. I mean, one of the classic things that I talk about when I'm teaching is that computers don't attack computers. It's individuals performing some action via computers. And, and so it's about these groups and these, these attackers and how they might be seeking to undermine the security and the safety, therefore, of their products. And so by getting them to think, the, the developers to think about how the threat actors might be targeting their devices and building scenarios and helping them to understanding the different types of approaches, we can also help them to understand the potential exposures and the risks that they've got potentially coming down the line so that they can start to put countermeasures in much earlier. And there's some information out there, some research out there that that kind of says the earlier you fix these security problems, the less it's going to cost you long term. And it's kind of almost, uh, you know, an exponential growth in the, in the cost from, you know, initial product idea to out in, in the wild in terms of the, the costs associated with fixing security issues. And so by taking this back early in the development cycle and fitting our approaches within weekly sprints and so on and getting, or two weekly sprints and getting people to think about this, has the effect that there's a continual improvement. But also one of the other things that uh, we're hoping to, to see is 
because you're covering the security aspects every two weeks and you're thinking about it in a structured way, it remains at the forefront. Unlike other concepts around security, where you may you know, do a security audit every six months or every three months at most, you don't have to worry about it you know, until you know, 12 weeks down the line. The fact that you're having to consider this security aspects and who might be after you every couple of weeks, alongside the kind of the core features that you want to develop, really helps to embed that as part of the security culture. So it's this constant improvement and working towards, you know, a, a secure minimal viable product within, within Agile, but also the constant raising of awareness of security issues. We're, we're hoping to see a, a, an overall improvement in security. All right. Well, Daniel Prince, thanks for joining us. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making this CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Inky. Inky helps companies secure email using a cloud-based security platform that proactively and instantly scans inbound, internal, and outbound emails to eliminate phishing, account takeover, and data leaks. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. Don't forget to check out the Grumpy Old Geeks podcast where I contribute to a regular segment called Security Ha! I join Jason and Brian on their show for a lively discussion of the latest security news every week. You can find Grumpy Old Geeks where all the fine podcasts are listed. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Ivan, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now a word from our sponsor, Trellix. Today, there's a new way to look at security, not just as a cause for concern, but as an opportunity to better your business. With a living security solution from Trellix, you can face your future with confidence, knowing that every day you're getting smarter and more agile. Threats are evolving, but so is your company. When you have a platform that's always learning and adapting, you can stay one step ahead of the threats. Incidents are on the rise, but your organization can rise above them. By tapping into open partnerships and native connections, you can respond to incidents in real time. Risk management is growing more complex, but your business has what it takes to overcome complexity. With embedded tools and expert insights, you can make risk management easy. Bring your security to life with Trellix. And we thank Trellix for sponsoring our show.